En Cuba tenemos un dicho, deja de comer mierda. Y es hora de que el mundo deje de pensar que todo lo que tenemos en Cuba... Sus cigarros, café o carteles de Che Guevara. Demasiado tiempo hemos estado bajo la sombra. Nuestros vecinos hispanos de México, Colombia o Argentina. Y hoy, finalmente, aprenderemos todo sobre la República de Cuba. Cuba, the tropical paradise of the Caribbean. Well known for the automobile classics reminding us of 50s Americana, touristy beaches, and the spot where the X-Men stopped the Cuban Missile Crisis. Yet, as we dig deeper into the Pearl of the Antilles, we'll discover that it was once the world's foremost sugar supplier, how its education is among the best in the Hispanic world, and a deeper look into the life of the one and only Fidel Castro. So let's not keep everyone waiting as we head straight into the action-packed history of Cuba. What's up everyone, my name is Tim and welcome back to History City. So Cuba is the first in a long list of countries in the Americas, and being that mysterious communist cousin in the Caribbean, its past is often overshadowed by the events of the Cold War. But to truly get a grasp on how Cuba got to where it is today, we must look back at the first settlers on the island. Before the arrival of the Spanish, Cuba was inhabited by a mixture of the Taino, Guanajuato Bay, and Sibonay peoples, with the Taino being especially famous for their peaceful and pacifist nature. The Taino also worshipped the Zemi, which could either be an ancestor spirit or a deity, but unfortunately the natives of Cuba lacked a writing system, and a lot of their stories were simply lost to the dust of time. For over a thousand years, not much changed for the Taino and other natives, until a strange Italian man showed up on the island's shores. By now, almost everyone on the planet has heard of Christopher Columbus, discovering America with his Nina, La Pinta, and Santa Maria, even though the Vikings did it first. Columbus, supported by the monarchs of Spain, set foot on the island on October 28, 1492. Capitan, what new land is this? This, my Fernando, is India. But my Capitan, didn't the Portuguese say that? Excuse me, is the wind talking? It barely took any time for the Spanish to start setting up colonies on the island. The conquistador Diego Vazquez de Coela establishing the town of Baracoa in eastern Cuba by 1511. When the Spanish first made contact with the natives, it kind of went like this. We come here in peace. Who are you? Uh, my name's Guama. We are Taino. So you guys want to do trade or something? No problem. Just let me ask the senor here what he thinks. So, uh, senor Vanasquez, what should we do with them? De gustaría habla en español. Velasquez's three-year-long conquest of Cuba was brutal, to say the least. Huge amounts of slaves were brought over from West Africa, and the natives either labored in the sugar plantations or died from the diseases brought by the Europeans. For much of Cuba's early recorded history, the island was governed by the encomienda system, a harsh labor system that gave conquistadors specific native groups to work under them. Abuse towards the natives was commonplace, and families were often separated because of this new system. While the encomienda was not universally accepted in 16th century Spain, it did not end until 1542. The year 1542 is an essential year in Cuban history, not only because it marked the end of the encomienda, but it was also the year the first cigar factories were built. The use of tobacco has a long history, going as far back as 3000 BC. Originally found in South America, tobacco usage by native groups mainly consisted of religious ceremonies and medicinal purposes. And it wasn't until its discovery by the Spanish that an international tobacco trade came into existence. The Cuban cigar industry entered its golden age in the 1800s, when Cuban cigar factories started rolling up cigars before exporting them overseas, preserving their longevity and maintaining their quality. So back to the 1500s, Cuba at that point was still considered much less important than Spain's mainland colonies, such as Mexico or Peru, due to the lack of gold. However, Cuba finally had its luck when the city of Havana became an important part of the Flota, a system for Spanish fleets carrying large amounts of treasures from the Americas that were brought to Spain. <sighs> but of course, the world's a place of greed and avarice, and the Caribbean has always been a battle royale for European colonial powers. 
For much of the 16th to 17th centuries, Cuba was repeatedly raided by French corsairs, who were state-sponsored pirates, who attempted to sneak off with some of that juicy treasure from the flota. But the Spanish weren't just going to sit back and watch the French take their cash. In order to protect Cuba from further raids, tons of forts were built across the island, making the island among the top fortified countries in the New World. For a while, the forts protected Cuba from the pirates, oh but unfortunately, they were no match for the British Navy. The 10 month long British occupation of Havana brought significant changes to Cuban life, with the British importing a massive amount of African slaves as well as forcing Cuba to open up trade. This demographic change in the 1700s resulted in nearly one third of the Cuban population composed of Africans. The influx of Africans in Cuba created somewhat of a hybrid culture for the island's residents, with syncretic religions such as Santeria emerging as well as the creation of the San Cubano genre of music. Speaking of music, the sound of you pressing the subscribe button is precisely that. By the 1800s, Cuba was experiencing the side effects of the revolutionary winds of change of Europe. But it wasn't all bad, as the revolution started by slaves in nearby Haiti led French coffee farmers to escape to Cuba for sanctuary, thus kickstarting the island's famous modern coffee production. The 19th century was also the point when Cuba mechanized their sugar producing industry, turning it into one of the most advanced in the world with the use of steam powered ingenios, at one point producing one third of the world's sugar supply. Cuba's success also created massive strain for the factory workers and resentment towards the elites in Nirvana, and it reached breaking point. While the majority of Spain's American colonies had gained their independence by the 1820s, Cuba continued to be under Spanish rule until 1898. But the 70 extra years of Spanish governance was constantly interrupted. Throughout the mid-1800s, constant rebellions against Spain were sponsored by the US government through a method known as filibustering where privately hired military companies would help the US government take over Latin American countries in times of peace. And by 1868, Cuba attempted its first independence movement under the leadership of Carlos Manuel de Cés Pérez, who freed his slaves and was joined mainly by Cuban abolitionists. However, after 10 years of revolt, the independence movement was suppressed by the Spanish government due to the lack of support from wealthy plantation owners. While Spain promised to offer more autonomy and political reforms in Cuba, such as abolishing slavery in 1886, the corruption of the Spanish government, as well as the growing reliance of the Cuban economy on the United States, led to the US multiple attempts to just buy the island. Not exactly the first time. By 1898, backed by the US government, Cuba gained its independence from Spain in the short but decisive Spanish-American War. But there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. As American forces occupied the so-called independent Cuba for the next eight years. The eight year long occupation of Cuba led to the modernization of the army, improved infrastructure, and the establishment of the infamous Guantanamo Bay detention camp. However, the United States had Cuba effectively by the balls, with the racial prejudice towards Afro Cubans supported by the electoral system, as well as several presidents being handpicked by Washington. Although Cuba saw a sharp rise in its GDP, as well as becoming one of the leading economies of Latin America by the 1950s, it suffered from extreme income inequality, unemployment, and an economy controlled by US investors. The most significant figure of early 20th century Cuba would be Fulgencio Batista, who was the two-time president of Cuba from 1940 to 1944 and 1952 to 1959. Batista was originally a military officer who toppled the ruling regime in 1933 and became Cuba's de facto leader with the support of both the socialist and communist political factions. While he was a social reformer, Batista was more of an opportunist than anything. During his rule, Havana became a den of corruption, with brothels and casinos controlled by the American Mafia, who funded Batista's regime. Batista's connections with the United States, as well as resentment over American criminal organizations' influence over Havana, gave more than enough reasons for the Cubans to stage anti-Batista riots and demonstrations. But being a well-known dictator with brutal tactics, Batista interrogated and tortured students across the country. His secret police, the Brock, uh, I'm sorry, but the full name's just way too long, assisted him with protest suppressions as well as public executions. By the end of his reign, an estimated 20,000 people were killed. While all this was going on, one man on a journey to overthrow Batista and oppose the United States was about to bring the world to a standstill. This man almost started the Third World War, survived allegedly over 600 assassination attempts, and led Cuba for the last 50 years. He is, of course, the El Comandante, Fidel Castro. Castro, needless to say, is a controversial man. Hated by the right, loved by the left, viewed with suspicion or admired by those in the center. 
but one thing that all sides can agree on is that he truly is a revolutionary icon. Born in Southeast Cuba to a wealthy sugar farming family, Castro immersed himself in the world of politics in his teens. Before the communist revolution in Cuba, Castro took part in multiple uprisings against right-wing governments in the Dominican Republic and Colombia. During his time in Colombia, Castro leaned further to the left after discovering more Marxist literature. By the time he returned to Cuba, Castro pursued a career in law and would visit the impoverished and predominantly African neighborhoods in Havana. In the 1950s, Castro became Batista's number one target, as the dictator was unable to successfully subdue the relentless revolutionary. While the odds seemed to be against Castro, Batista's army was demoralized and underfed. The combination of deserters from the army, volunteers, and successful propaganda eventually led to the end of Batista's reign, who ultimately led to Portugal. And under the leadership of Castro, Cuba transformed into a communist state, and everything changed after the year of 1959. For over a century, Cuba's main economic partner was the United States, and its survival almost depended on American investments. However, the ongoing Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States affected countries around the world through proxy wars, with the Korean War ending just a few years before Castro's revolution. To the United States, the greatest threat to its existence was the communist ideology, and having a close neighbor who took sharing his caring to the extreme was not exactly ideal. When the communist government took over, everything from heavy industries to cigar businesses were completely nationalized. Persecution of opposition was rampant, and the death toll matched the numbers of Batista's regime. But more importantly, Cuba expropriated all American businesses on the island, leading to a severing of U.S.-Cuban relations. Castro's fierce anti-American rhetoric turned the Soviet Union into Cuba's new best friend. Worried by the turn of events, the U.S. government financed an expedition of anti-Castro Cuban exiles to end communist rule on the island. Known as the Bay of Pigs invasion, it failed spectacularly and instead turned Castro into a national hero. By 1962, the Cold War was at its height, and the placement of American missiles in Turkey led to the Soviets using Cuba as their Caribbean base for a nuclear attack on the United States. The Cuban Missile Crisis of 62 was one of the closest times the world was to a third world war. And if it wasn't for the X-Men, none of us would be alive today. Damn you Marvel, don't lie to the kids! The real hero that prevented the war was Vasily Arkhipov, a Soviet naval officer who refused to authorize the use of nuclear torpedoes against the US Navy. Somebody please give this guy some credit! Castro's government continued to implement more orthodox Marxist policies throughout Cuba in the 70s and 80s. And the government's decision to supply revolutionaries to Ethiopia and Angola isolated Cuba from much of the non-aligned countries. But as the Soviet Union slowly opened up, Cuba's influence faded as well. A combination of declining sugar and coffee production further worsened the struggling economy. And the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991 shook Cuba to the core. Without Soviet economic and military aid, Cuba knew that it had to adapt to be part of the new era. By the 2000s, the Cuban government gradually liberalized by allowing small private businesses, foreign investments, and reintroduced religious holidays and services. These reforms, while supported by much of the population, made many question whether communism was necessary. And by 2008, the aging Castro stepped down as president and transferred his position to his brother, Raul. But a monumental moment arrived in Cuba in 2014, when the Obama administration attempted to normalize relations with the Cuban government. Travel restrictions became even less restricted, and the reapproachment seemed to work. Reforms reached new heights under Raul Castro when private property became legalized in 2011. But as the world looked upon a change in Cuba, the old revolutionary who fundamentally transformed the country died in 2016. Fidel Castro's death sent shockwaves around the world, and was seen as a test for the new leadership of Cuba. Another surprise from the Cuban government was the new president of Cuba, Miguel Diaz-Canel, who was the first non-blood-related leader since the revolution. With more liberal reforms on the way, who knows where Cuba will be heading next. But needless to say, Cuba's mysterious nature and sexy salsas will continue to charm the world. An island of poets, music, and storytellers. Cuba, don't ever stop being yourself. Shout out to Lexi for helping me out so much in this video, and I know I need to work on my Spanish pronunciation. And if any of you are interested in helping out in future videos, my email is in the link in the description. And once again, thank you all for watching, and please like and subscribe to help this channel grow, and so this Asian man can pay for his uni tuition.
quedó tu cara en camisetas y postales.